Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 4, Episode 16, A Session. This episode first aired February 26th, 1996. Before we get into this one, anything to say about the previous episode, Bar Association? No, it was perfect. I think it's fair to say it was not my favorite episode of the season. It suffered from a lot of Ferengi, yes. Yeah, though not the worst Ferengi episode that we've seen. So should we try this one? I think we should get started on this one. Not a lot of Ferengi in this one. Very low Ferengi count. In the cold open, Miles and Julian return from some Sweet shenanigans to Miles' messy quarters. He needs to clean up because Keiko is coming home. So they're in World War II flying gear. I guess they've had enough of the Ren Faire program. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really funny how costumey their Sweet programs are. Yeah. Really, they maybe just want to be in musical theater. Oh, Hey, that's something they're missing out with on the station. Yes. It does not have an amateur dramatic society that we are aware of. Oh, it totally should. Miles' quarters really are a mess. I mean, you can barely even <laughs> walk in there with all the junk everywhere. I mean, it's not full of beer cans and pizza boxes, but it looks like it's full of projects. Yes, I can kind of relate to Miles here. Yeah, I imagine that you can. <laughs> I think if I didn't demand some space in the house, you would have projects everywhere. I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, then we go to Keiko and Molly returning to the station. The shot of the shuttle approaching the station seems like a real upgrade. Yes, definitely the special effects budget went up for this season. Yeah, it really did. No complaints about that. I love the space stuff. No, it's cool. Well, Keiko arrives with news that she's pregnant. At first, I thought he was going to say, but I haven't seen you for a year. But apparently they started trying on her last visit. <laughs> and that was all it took. <laughs> But anyway, Miles seems uncomfortable and weird about it, but Keiko and Molly at least seem happy. This is jumping straight into the bad sitcom, like the episode where Cisco got freaked out that his girlfriend wanted to move in. This is yeah. the Miles is surprised by his wife getting pregnant, even though they were planning on having kids, already had a kid, and how is it a big surprise? Yeah, it's like he didn't know what was going to happen. This is... Uh... I feel this is just bad 80s sitcom writing. Was this a script left over from some crappy 80s show and they just worked it in here? And it's almost like it would have been one thing if she had just said she was pregnant and then Miles was shocked. Yeah. But instead she said, well, we talked about it and then we tried to get pregnant. Remember? Why would? And even then he's still weird about it. I, yeah, it was weak. Yeah, why wouldn't Miles be happy? I have no idea. And it makes no sense throughout this whole episode why he's not happy. Right. From my perspective, the guys specifically I've known and worked with who have been trying to have a family and when their partner's gotten pregnant, they have been bouncing off the walls is the only way to describe it. It just doesn't seem to fit. This crap really irritates me. I feel it's a really negative view of Miles and is playing to like really just poor stereotypes. Yeah, I have a few notes about that <laughs> in the overanalysis section as well. Yeah. But it definitely doesn't feel right. Yeah. We've talked about this before. It's like they just don't know how to write a married couple or a couple maybe at all. Yeah. And this sort of interaction is really strange. Right, right. Well, on to ops where a never before seen Vedic, Vedic Porta, arrives with a young couple in tow. He has a little chat with Kira before she leads them to Cisco's office. The young couple has just gotten married and they're there for the blessing from the emissary. Cisco gives them a Bajoran blessing and they thank him and leave. I don't know if you've noticed this, but Bajoran fashions outside of the military uniforms seem to tend towards a medieval peasant look. It's very Star Trek Next Gen, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, you yeah. know, Star Trek Voyager. It's very much in line with that, where it just seems like people are wearing pajamas. <laughs> like, you know, there's no real tailored clothes. Yeah. Sometimes I think it's because they didn't want to make the investment in these super tailored clothes or what people would normally be wearing. Yeah. It's really strange because you're supposed to think like the Bajorans have been around for thousands of years. And are you saying that truly over thousands of years, the best they can do is this? <laughs> right? You kind of just got to get used to that in Star Trek. It's one of the things that in the new show Picard, 
I really appreciate. It's oh, like, yeah. oh, somebody paid attention to the costumes. Yes. You can like or not like the series, but the clothes are are an upgrade. Absolutely agreed. Oh, maybe he was actually coming from using the Renfair Holosuite program. Well, I was just going to say that. <laughs> Maybe he's the one who's in the play uh, and, you know, Miles and Julian are in the airplanes. <laughs> it is kind of a cute scene because the two of them really seem sort of in awe of meeting the emissary. Once again, we see Cisco seeming to be just really uncomfortable with this position that he's in. I describe his attitude as coming off as sort of reluctant. Reluctant, but... He's learned the blessing yep. and he said it in Bajoran. And so at least he's doing it. Right. He's kind of accepted it, but he's not super enthusiastic yeah. about it. That's definitely true. Though I ask this all the time, why would the universal translator not translate it? I, that's always so confusing to me. Of What's the value of him saying something in Bajoran? Because wouldn't every single thing that he says sound Bajoran to the Bajorans? True. So how is it different? I think maybe he's saying it in Bajoran. So you'd like see his lips sync to the actual Bajoran words. I see. So it would seem more personal. Okay. Well, Vedic Porta compliments Cisco on his accent. So apparently he's getting a little bit better. And then everybody leaves. And Dax says that being the emissary isn't so bad, right? <laughs> and Cisco doesn't think it's a bad yeah. thing. It's just hard getting used to being a religious icon. Dax says, really? I think I'd like it. Yeah, she probably would. Maybe the line of the episode. That is such a Dax comment. Oh, yeah, I'd love to be a religious icon. That sounds fun. I think it fits with the Dax symbiont and Jadzir as well, from what we see. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to speculate here. Oh. The way Cisco was behaving... I get the impression that perhaps what Avery was aiming for with Cisco in this situation of him being the emissary is that Cisco is feeling imposter syndrome. I would think that's exactly what you would feel in that same situation. He doesn't feel like a religious icon. Yeah. Even when he went through the wormhole, that wasn't a religious experience for him when he connected with the aliens or the prophets or whatever that you want to call right. them. But when he came out of it, it was a religious experience for everybody else. So, of course, he wouldn't feel like it was right or real. But he's at least he's trying. Yes. Yeah. And I like the way Avery, as an actor, is certainly for me, giving me that impression. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kira calls to say something is coming through the wormhole. It's an ancient light ship that is about 300 years old. It didn't trigger the sensors on the other side of the wormhole, so they aren't sure where it came from. There's a Bajoran life form on board who's not responding to hail, so they beam the person to the infirmary. I'm shocked we didn't just beam him right to ops, you know, like we usually do. Oh, yeah. Do. He might have had a disease. They could have spread it around the station more easily. Yeah, you spread it faster if you start in ops. Yeah. Beam him into quarks. <laughs> right on the promenade. <laughs> <laughs> now we have Bashir scanning a Bajoran dude played by Richard Libertini from many things, including being the back and bowl guy from the movie All of Me. Yeah, my notes here say, insert back and bowl joke. <laughs> he comes to, and when Kira asks who he is, he says, I am the emissary. And everyone looks at each other, uh-oh. <laughs> and Cisco says, woohoo, and does a little dance. <laughs> Not really, <laughs> but in his head. It would have fitted. <laughs> I mean, you can see it in his eyes. Yeah. And we cue the theme song. After the theme, the new guy talks about being on his way to Bajor when his ship was caught in an ion storm. A strange opening appeared in space, and he realized the prophets were opening the gates of the celestial temple and drawing him to it. He says the prophets took the form of people he knew, and they gave him back his life by repairing an injury he had, and he felt reborn. So this is pretty consistent with the same thing that happened to Cisco, where the prophets communicate to him through people he knew. Right, which is why I think Cisco believed him. And yes. then we learn that he thinks he left Bajor only a few days ago, and he's shocked to find out it was actually over 200 years ago. He says his name is Akoram Lan, which shocks Kira because she knows him as one of the greatest poets in Bajor's history. He isn't sure yet why he's the emissary, but the prophets gave him back his life for a reason. Then he learns that Kira is in the military, and he's shocked because he says her family would be part of the artist Dejara. How would he know everybody's Dejara? That's the first note <laughs> about yeah. this. I never understand stuff like that. Well, maybe because Bajoran society at that point was so entrenched in a caste system, you would know the typical kind of things that people did. Were there like only 10 names? There's thousands of names. How do you keep it straight? 
maybe the Bajorans do not have a huge number of last names. I suppose it's possible. Maybe also they sound the same, and that's how they're marked as uh, the same Jara. So they would all have a similar prefix or suffix. Yeah, And you'd maybe. hear that and go, oh, that's a whatever. Like maybe there's Nerys and Baris yes. and Caris and Deris. <laughs> Oh, exactly, exactly. Well, Kira yeah. explains to us that Bejar used to have a strict caste system and a person's work was dictated by what family they were born into. Akorum is shocked that Bejar doesn't follow the Dejaras anymore. Kira said we had to give that up to fight the Cardassians because we all became soldiers. I mean, apart from that soldier part, it seems like a good idea to not force everyone into a particular job just because of their name, but I digress. <laughs> More on that later. Cisco is talking to Dax in his office about how the prophecies make more sense with a quorum as the emissary. <laughs> Cisco yeah. thinks they literally gave a quorum back his life. And also, he was the first one to find the wormhole, not Cisco. So clearly, this guy is the real emissary. Dax finds it interesting that Cisco doesn't believe in the prophecies, <laughs> yet he's using them to give up his position as emissary. He's clearly very happy to let a quorum have the job. Dax really kind of calls him out on yeah, that. Yeah, that was pretty good. I thought you didn't believe in the prophecies. And the way he replies, oh, I don't. But he's totally prepared to use yeah. them to justify getting out of being the emissary. Absolutely. Well, I suppose they're thrown in his face frequently as to why he is the emissary. So yeah. he's going to use them the other direction. Yeah, he does seem somewhat relieved that he'll be off the but hook. For sure. He says that Quorum actually wants this job and Starfleet will be thrilled for Cisco to get out of that role. Vedic yeah. Porta told him that as long as he makes it clear he's stepping aside voluntarily, Bejar will accept a quorum as the emissary. Might I say that that is a pile of crap. It's a religion. <laughs> An entire faction will be prepared to die saying Cisco is the true emissary. I mean, that's baloney. Oh, yeah. Remember, Kira had made a comment a long time ago about how Bajorans have an opinion on everything. <laughs> yes. From the interpretation of the prophecies to the weather. It, it would be yeah. exactly what I would expect. You would have half the people going, this is a false emissary. Cisco is right, the emissary. Exactly. Especially when it's something religious, though, because it's so tied to faith. And yes. when you have to believe in something, you're not going to just easily change your mind. It's oh, not right. like somebody shows you some data in a spreadsheet and it's going to change what you have faith in. That's just not how it works. And if you look at column B, you will see this is why <laughs> yes. a quorum is the emissary. And precisely. Yeah. Well, Cisco is happy to just be a Starfleet officer again. He says he feels like he's on vacation. Definitely happy to be off the hook. Miles is on his way to his quarters when Bashir pulls him into Quarks for a celebratory drink. Bashir is congratulating Miles on the baby and Miles is like, oh, sure. Yeah, I'm excited. Aye. Worf comes in and Quark asks if he heard that Keiko is going to have another baby. And Worf says, now? <laughs> <sighs> Miles tells Julian that Worf helped deliver Molly, which even talking about this is making Worf uncomfortable. Oh, yes. When Miles says the new baby will arrive in seven months and Bashir said that he'll be sure and ask for Worf's help in the delivery room, Worf awkwardly says he'll be away from the station at that time, <laughs> far away. And then he runs away. That was really cute. I like that. It was a good tie-in to Next Gen as well. When Julian kind of pokes at why he's acting the way he is, Miles says that he thought he'd get to spend some time with Keiko before the next baby came along, which is maybe why you should have talked to your wife about that. Yeah, you know, maybe he could have tried a <laughs> radical concept called talking to your partner. Well, I understand why he would want that. She's been off the station for a long time working on that other project, right, down on Bajor. Yeah. And I could get why he would want to spend time with her. But you should tell her that. Have that conversation. That, of course, is the thing that they have no idea how right, to write. Right. Or they feel like maybe it's too boring if you show a couple that just, you know, communicates. <laughs> Instead, you have to have this sort of, I don't know, silliness. I wonder if part of it is they're writing about their own really crappy relationships that they had with their first <laughs> wife before she divorced them. Or maybe their parents. Maybe. Maybe their parents, yeah. Oh, my dad never talked to his wife. Why would he? Yeah, okay. Maybe that is a generational thing. Yeah. But it's tough to watch here. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I will just say it. I find this painfully bad to watch. And it, it would have made so much more sense if he was hesitant to have a baby because he wanted to spend more time with Keiko because she'd been away for so long. But he was reluctant maybe to tell her or, or whatever, you know, that kind of a thing. And then 
Bashir could help him come to terms with, hey, if you want to have a relationship, you got to talk about it. You know what I mean? They should have just done something different to establish a better relationship instead of this. Right. Because right. It, this is just like a a trope at this point. Completely. It fits more in a, a sitcom trope. Exactly. Like yeah. A bad sitcom. The promenade is filled with Bajorans now as a quorum is going to make his first public speech. When Odo asks Kira how she can accept the new emissary so quickly, she says it's a matter of faith, and she has faith that it's the right thing. I like that Odo was kind of picking on her about this. Yeah. Two days earlier, it was Cisco, and you've just changed your mind. Yeah. I feel Kira here kind of sums up the dangers of absolute blind faith. You mean because she just says, oh, well, I believe that then, and now I believe this. Exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. It's like you say, the trouble with zealots. Hmm. I do have that down as a possible title for this episode. <laughs> oh, well, we've already had that. Isn't this more trouble with zealots? Yeah, oh, maybe it is. Well, then a quorum comes out in his new fancy emissary outfit with Porta right by his side. The new emissary thinks the reason the prophets kept him away for so long was so that he could return when Bejar needed him most to heal a great wound from the occupation, which is a pretty good story to tell yourself. Absolutely. He says, Bejar has lost its way, and the Dejaras are the will of the prophets, so getting back to them will help heal the wounds of Bejar. Kira looks a little unsure. Yeah. Along with a few others in the crowd, there's some mumbling. And then he says, if we return to the Dejaras, it will be like the occupation never happened. It will be like we erased it forever. Yikes. I notice when they show the crowd scene, there are a number of Bejorans who are not clapping. Absolutely. There is a mixed result in the crowd. Yes, and even at the end... Kira kind of slowly joins in, very unenthusiastically, I'll add. Agreed. And Odo gives such a funny look of the when she's clapping of sort of, huh, you don't seem totally on board with this. Well, even if you're not on board with the Dejaris yeah. part of it, this thing about erasing a bad thing from history and erasing it from your memory, I mean, that just means that not only are you going to repeat it, yeah. But you're not learning anything from it. You'll never evolve. It's a terrible idea. I kind of feel for a quorum here. I can see what he's attempting to do. And I think it comes from a good place. He is in a time, if you like, Bejor seemed to be doing pretty well. And he learns of this thing that's going to happen in his future. And I yeah. think he sees the good times that he has and he wants Bejor to experience it again. So he wants to take things back to how it was then. He doesn't see it as a negative thing. Well, no, because I'm sure it was great for him. Imagine if you took someone from 200 years in our history who was perfectly happy in their perfect life, whatever life they were living, and you had that person decide how we were going to live now. Oh, yeah. Like, I guess if you took a medieval lord. Yeah, somebody from the 1820s who had everything that he needed. It's rarely good for people who were marginalized yeah. before to go back to the so-called good old days. Right. That's what I imagine is going on in the crowd, right? These people who have managed to overcome stuff that they were pigeonholed yeah. into, they finally got to move forward. And now this guy's turned up and he wants to take them back 200 years because he was happy 200 years ago. I think it's because he lacks the vision of what Bejo could be like without these things. He hasn't experienced a world without it. Agreed. But also I think somebody needs to tell him that you can't erase this tragedy from history. Right. Sure, maybe you weren't there for yeah. it, but erasing it is a terrible idea. And I think, yeah, that again is where he lacks the understanding. Well, as we said, there's just a smattering of clapping on the floor, but some are clearly really unhappy. Right. And this includes Cisco, who is watching from a TV screen in his office. At least they've got some cameras in the station now. Yeah, yeah, finally. Took four seasons. Well, Cisco is meeting with Akorum and Vedic Porta. Akorum kind of doubles down on what he said earlier. Yeah. He thinks this is literally what the prophets have sent him to do. Cisco wonders if they intend to ask First Minister Shakar to step down. But Akorum says, oh, no. But by next election, he doubts Bejar would elect a farmer. Oh, dear. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. I, I like this guy for about 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of stuck in this rigid mindset. Sure, it reminds yeah. me of like the Ferengi. You know, they're stuck in this world and they can't move on from it. Yeah, but this is just one guy. One guy who's appearing as the emissary. Ugh, but they, uh, they already had an emissary. This is why I'm telling you. <laughs> All of those people on the floor who are not clapping are like, oh, no, Cisco's still my emissary. Yeah. 
Forget this guy. It's Bajoran Protestants. The note that I took here was that this guy and Kai Win must be best pals. That was even before he mentions <laughs> Kai Win, which <laughs> I will say when we get there. But when the ancient Bajorans came up with the caste system, they already knew all of the possible jobs for everyone for all of time. Yes, which is pretty impressive. I mean, in ancient times, figuring out that you needed a network administration yeah. or infrastructure engineer is pretty impressive. Yeah, amazing. Or an electrician. I suppose if you think that the prophets came up with them, you can convince yourself of anything. This is why blind faith is so dangerous. Yeah, which is why I think Kai Wen and this guy would be pals. Akoram and Porta think it will take a while to get everyone on board with this plan. Yeah. But eventually the people will support enforcement of the Dajaras by legal sanction. In other words, if someone defies their Dajara, there will be legal repercussions, including deportation. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Cisco says the forced caste system goes against the Federation charter, so their petition to join the Federation will be rejected. Akoram says he's already talked to Kai Wynn, and they're okay with it. <laughs> Quote, <laughs> yeah. it's a sacrifice they're willing to make to follow the way of the uh -huh. prophets. Of course she would. Why is that Kai Wynn's decision? Why isn't it Shakar's decision? I mean, the politics of Bajor are so weird. Yeah, and to me it seems like the politics of Bajor are very religious focused. Yeah. And can change on a dime. Yeah. In which case, why are you so desperate to get them into the Federation when they really haven't sorted their crap out yet? Yeah. And it's probably also why there are people in the Federation suspicious of allowing Bajor yeah. in. Because they're so stuck in this stuff. This is an example. They're all following this path. This new guy turns up and, hey, 180, we want to go back to the good old days. Yeah. You know, where we could stone unbelievers and deport them. Oh, Gosh. As they're leaving, Cisco says he can't interfere as a Starfleet officer, but as a friend of Bajor, giving up Federation membership is a mistake. Then a quorum abruptly grabs Cisco's ear. We have not had a lot of ear grabbing lately. Not since really season one, where we did it all the time. But he says, your pock is strong. I see now why Kai Opaka thought you were the emissary and why Kai Win fears you. Whoa! And then he just says, goodbye, and leaves. Come on, that's a big one. He said it out loud. He did, which was quite interesting. Yeah, we've always known, but he's actually said she fears him. It, it makes perfect sense that she would fear yeah. him. He doesn't think like her. He's not Bajoran. Before this episode, he has fallen into this role as emissary, right. a religious icon, which she killed someone to become the leader of that religious yes. group. So it would make sense that she would fear him because she had no control over him. But yeah, he just says it out loud. But still, the ear grabbing was rude. I would give some advice to Cisco now, which is hire some additional security because I'm pretty sure the next religious assassin that Kai Wynn sends, it'll be gunning for Cisco. <laughs> well, not anymore. Oh, I think she'd hold a grudge. Oh, I see what you mean, because he's not the emissary yes. anymore. Now she can take him out. Well, I think now, out of sight, out of mind, she doesn't <laughs> care about him. She's more like, I got to get the people out of the way who are trying to block me. And now yeah. he's nothing to her anymore. For now. And I guess for her as well, she now has the ear of the emissary. This guy is on board with her. Oh, my gosh. That's true. Yeah. And very punny that you would say the ear after <laughs> we just had the ear incident. Thank you. I think this is another insight into the character of Cisco because when a quorum leaves, Cisco says goodbye, emissary. He's actually respectful of the guy despite yeah. the disagreement. It's sort of the opposite of win. Oh, well, sure. Now we go to the replomat, and a woman gives up her chair for Kira, saying she's in a lower-ranking Dejara. Cisco, unimpressed, says this has been going on all morning. Cisco looks so unhappy in this scene. Absolutely. Head in hands. He is not having a good time. Kira takes the chair and sits down, saying it's strange to be treated with respect without earning it. She says the emissary is asking for something difficult, but we have to have faith that he's guiding us somewhere. Cisco is surprised that they'd listen to the emissary no matter what. And Kira says, we would have tried to do whatever you asked of us when you were the emissary. And then they both kind of smile and Kira heads to ops. She never even drank her rack to Gino. That look on Kira's face when the woman gives up the chair. Yeah. Shocked and horrified at the same time. And confused. Yeah. Yeah, it makes no sense to her. Right. Yeah. The other thing is, I feel that Cisco never really realized of just how important the emissary is to Bajor. And even though 
Kira mm. had talked to him about it before. I don't think she'd ever really spelled out that we'd pretty much do anything you wanted. It surprises me that Cisco wouldn't have known that. Like, did he do no reading about this job? <laughs> this is where I think there's a little bit of a plot hole as well. If the majority of Bajor is deeply religious and will try to do anything that the emissary wants. Yeah. And we know Cisco is Federation and wants Bajor to join. Why wouldn't literally all of Bajor be clamoring to join? Because the emissary is a member of the Federation and is a Federation citizen. Therefore, Bajor should follow the emissary and join. And I'm sure there were people who thought that, but Cisco was never going to stand up and really proclaim that, that they should do that because of the reason that he just said. Right. That he wasn't really allowed to say things like that as a member of Starfleet. Yes. But if the Bajorans are so religious and believe in the emissary completely, yeah. you would want to, if you like, emulate what the emissary does. Oh, yeah. I think there are a lot of holes like that with this religious stuff. Yeah. I guess the other alternative is, well, a quorum was a Bajoran. And maybe there was a little Bajoran prejudice there of, well, Cisco isn't actually a Bajoran. So even if he's the emissary, maybe I don't quite have to listen to him. I'm sure some of that was going on. At the same time, there's a church of Cisco somewhere. Oh, you know it. Yeah. They're probably bigger fanboys than me. Oh, yes, I would think so. <laughs> so now Cisco is tossing and turning in his sleep, and he decides to get up and walk the promenade, which is completely deserted. Why would he put on his uniform? I thought that was very strange. Anyway, as he walks, everything goes dark, and he runs into Kai Opaka Naomi Osaka, who just keeps asking him over and over, who are you? She says, how can I know someone who doesn't know himself? And then he's zapped back to the promenade. Right. And the lights come back on. So do you think he was still on the promenade when he was having that vision and the lights just went off? Yes. Oh, I assumed that he was taken into the wormhole by the prophets. Migraine trigger. Okay. Off we go to the infirmary and Bashir says Cisco experienced what Bajorans call an orb shadow. Hallucinations that come after exposure to the orbs of the prophets also known as migraine triggers. Or it could be a repressed Trill personality. <laughs> it could be, if you were Trill. <laughs> this was the same thing that was happening to Dax. That's true. The lights would go off, and then she'd get a bunch of weird cryptic messages. Exactly. Bashir says it's brought on by an excess of neuropeptides for which he can provide an inhibitor. Cisco agrees to this awfully quickly. I mean... Wouldn't you want to see what the prophets are trying to tell you first? I guess he's still in denial about the prophets. I think that fits with Cisco's view of I'm not the emissary. I wonder if going forward, he's going to look at these kinds of things differently. I guess you probably know, but I certainly don't know. Bashir does tell him the Bajorans believe you only have a shadow if you're trying to ignore what the prophets <laughs> are telling you. Uh-oh. Uh... <laughs> I did think for sure at that point he was going to say, okay, don't give me the shot, but he doesn't. Yeah. Cisco jokes that the prophets are just trying to tell him that he has too many neuropeptides. I think this is the whole focus that Cisco has been ignoring and denying it this whole time. Yeah. I imagine that stung when Bashir said that, like, oh man, trying to get rid of these prophets. <laughs> it's something that he's been trying to deny himself. Absolutely. Well, now in Kira's quarter, she's trying unsuccessfully to sculpt a bird out of clay. It's not going well. She's just got a bunch of lumps of clay everywhere. Well, she can make lumpy clay. That's, you know, pretty close. But sculpting is, that's a hard place oh, to start. Gosh, it's unbelievably hard. Well, later when she's talking to Vedic Porta, he says, birds are difficult to sculpt. She should have started with something simpler. Exactly. Yeah, maybe she could make a bowl for holding her incense reference to Lower Decks there. Well, she does have incense burning sometimes. Exactly. Not lately. Perfect. Yeah. She could have started <laughs> she could have started with something simple. <laughs> like what a fourth graders do in art class. Vedic Porta says she didn't give herself completely over to the task. She's still wearing her military uniform and clinging to a false life. Typical blame Kira. <laughs> He says she must give herself completely over to the prophets, and then she will know more joy than she ever thought possible. In Miles' quarters, Keiko is asking about Miles' weird Holosuite costumes. Miles is trying to teach Molly how to play darts, but she's not really into it because, well, she's a child. My note here says, more lame family interaction stuff, and I just basically blanked out to the next scene. Uh, yeah, my note says, um, this is dumb. <laughs> he looks longingly at his weird Holosuite costume, which Keiko notices. <sighs> it's just so ham-fisted. <laughs> it's beaten to death I mean, with a ham hock. 
We've said this before when they've tried to do relationship stuff yeah. or really kind of heartfelt stuff that has to do with maybe with this marriage or with other relationships. Yeah. It's like you can see way in the distance the thing that they're trying right. to do, but it's like they let a teenager write it yes. or somebody who's never been through it write it yeah. or someone yeah. who, like you said, has only had one failed marriage because whatever, <laughs> or they've had a, you know a bad connection to relationships with their parents. I would be okay with there being a bad relationship on the station. I mean, that could absolutely happen. Right. But not every relationship is going to be this completely broken. And, you know, the people just are, they don't communicate and there's just total dysfunction. Like I said, this is the story of one writer's failed marriage. <laughs> and you've been complaining to me about this for a week. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I get drive-bys of this all week because... We don't want to talk about what happens in the episode or we don't want to ruin our conversation for the podcast. We generally don't discuss what we see or what we think about it. But James can't help himself. And this topic, he just every time he would walk by, he'd just be like, oh, my God, the thing with Miles was so stupid. I'm like, stop talking about it. So now it's all coming out. That's completely true. Yes. A completely accurate summary. Absolutely. And now in Cisco's office, Cisco is upset that he's failing in his mission to bring Bajor into the Federation. He says it's ironic that Starfleet wanted him to distance himself from the emissary stuff. And now that he has, they're saying he is failing. That seems about right for the Federation. I could see a lot of finger pointing going on. Yeah, for sure. And he's also feeling like he really did fail. Yeah. Kira then breaks the news to him that she's going to resign. She figures she can move back to her home and apprentice with an artist. Oh. She says it's something she has to do, though she's clearly not happy about it. He says she can't be replaced. And they both look, I would say, devastated. Yeah. And oh my gosh, is that just a sad moment in this episode? Oh, Avery just puts so much feeling into the way he says, but replace you? Yeah. Oh, that was fantastic. These two had gone from being sort of rivals for running the station. From episode one. Yeah. yeah. To now that they are such colleagues and friends and people they would give their lives for. It took me a while to get really attached to the next generation. Yeah. And it was when stuff like this started to happen between the characters. Right. right. That I became really attached to it. Yeah. And so I appreciate this. I mean, this moment, this just few seconds at the end of that scene yes. really stood out to me as, okay, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm looking for right. in Star Trek. And probably, honestly, in every show that I watch, <laughs> that's really what I want. Even yeah, stuff yeah. I read, you know, I want that connection and I want to believe it. And I really believed it here. And you're saying that, yeah, they started as rivals and they've kind of gone on this journey to get here, but more so just in this season and kind of towards the end of last season, as we started to understand what was going on with Kira in terms of how she was looking at Cisco yes. and how she right. was trying so hard to kind of repress that religious icon feeling that she had for him. And just do her job and to make sure that he didn't fail in his job. And then for her to hear him say, oh, I have failed. And also for her to now be looking at him like, well, I guess you're not my emissary anymore. And I have to give this up, this thing that we've built. Yeah. And this respect that has grown so much between us. I have to now give that up and go and do something I don't want to do, but I have to follow my faith. I mean, it was such a great little tiny moment. I imagine you and I even read more into it than what was written, but yeah. it was really, really good. Yes. It worked so well. Miles and Julian see each other in Quark's and they seem super thrilled to see each other. They're both sad and miss each other. Quark reminds them they have a hollow suite reserved with the Battle of Britain. And he says, no refunds. <laughs> and again, if they have no money, how are they paying Quark? Whatever. Never makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, I was laughing about that because I had literally just edited the part where you're talking about the economics of the previous episode. And you're like, oh, I right. don't understand. What is the point of money? How does it work? No, it's, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. How can they, how can you mix? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway. <laughs> Odo calls Cisco to the promenade because someone has been killed. That came out of nowhere in watching this episode. There's a dead Bajoran lying on the floor, and Vedic Porta just comes out and says he pushed the dude from the second floor because his family name is unclean. Akira says they prepare the dead for burial. 
And Porta says that he asked him to resign from his position in his order, I guess. Because he was a cleric. And returned to his proper Jara, but he refused, so he had to kill him. If a Vedic can't do what the emissary asks of them, how can we expect anyone else to? Yikes. Yeah. Lunatic. <laughs> there, right there, is the danger of a rigid caste system. And he seems so shocked when Odo arrests him. I mean, more trouble with zealots. Precisely. This guy was, he was a Vedic. I mean, he was a cleric within the Bajoran faith, and he just killed him. Well, because he had to, and he just seems fine with it. That's true. He did have to. He was lower caste. Oh, yeah, that guy took quite a turn in this episode. He did, didn't he? He was just an old murderous he monk. he seemed so nice in the opening scene. Yeah. <laughs> he to... Oh, goodness. Well, now Cisco is talking to Akorum. He's not much help. He just says, change is never easy, but he's just following the will of the prophets. Oh, he's taking no responsibility that... Oh, it's so Kai Win. His actions have caused so this. So Kai Win. Yeah. And this is making Cisco regret giving up the title of emissary. Cisco says he's changed his mind and he's willing to accept the role now. But Akorum figures that now the people of Bajor support him and would choose him if given a choice. Yeah. Since neither wants to divide Bajor, Cisco proposes they settle it by going into the wormhole and asking the prophets. Good idea. I feel Cisco should actually have said here, we have to go to the celestial temple. It would be the right thing to say if you want to be a religious icon. Well, that's true, but I guess he's only talking to one person. Yeah. Something else here. Yeah. You can see Cisco feels something is just wrong and that he has to get involved. Right. Because isn't this a violation of the Prime Directive? A hundred percent. He's challenging the religious icon of a non-Federation people. A hundred percent. He's doing exactly what he said he couldn't do. Yeah. Because he believes it's wrong, which right. is just what Picard would do. <laughs> well, Picard would have actually just convinced him through a... He would have written a letter. Very, very convincing speech. <laughs> So into the wormhole we go, and it doesn't take long for the prophets or the wormhole aliens to grab them. They are linear. They appear to be in the infirmary, and the prophet that looks like Kira says, this is the Cisco. And a prophet Bashir says, this is the one that was injured about the other guy. Yes. And they ask why they are here, and a quorum says they're there to prove to the non-believer, also known as the Cisco, <laughs> that the prophet sent a quorum to put Bajor back on the right path. He wants them to tell Cisco that he was the first to find the temple. But of course, the prophets don't understand time. So who came first just makes no sense to them. Yes. I didn't see that coming. I wasn't prepared for that. But obviously, that that's was how they great. would look at yeah. it. Some guy who came in 300 years ago and a guy who came in yesterday, time is irrelevant for them. The same thing. Yeah. It's like the pandemic. Time is soup. <laughs> yes. A quorum says he knows he was spared the occupation so he could bring the Dejaras back to Bajor. Cisco asks if that's really what they want, and the prophet that looks like Vedic Porta says the Dejaras are what Cisco would call the past. Whoa, there it is. The Cisco taught us what once was can never be again. So a quorum asks if they are part of the past, why did you send me to the future? This confuses the prophets, of course, because they don't understand what that yes. means. They say, for the Cisco. And a quorum realizes that Cisco is the emissary. Yes, he turns to look at Cisco and says, you're saying he is your emissary? Then I was wrong. He's shocked. Yeah. Cisco proposes that they just return a quorum to his original time. The Odo prophet says he'll remember nothing of what was happened. And flash, he's gone. There's been a lot of memory erasing in this season, hasn't there? <laughs> yes, there has. Well, now a prophet version of Kaiopaka asks Cisco why he's still there. She says, we are of Bajor. You are of Bajor. And then poof, he's back in the shuttle by himself. Yes. That gave me goosebumps, even though I don't know what any of it meant. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of questions about this in my own analysis. <laughs> I feel bad for a quorum here. He really did seem quite crestfallen. Yeah, but you know what? He got to go back to his life with his wife, and he's probably perfectly happy. It's the way he says, you should have let me die. And the prophets agree pretty quickly to that. <laughs> They're like, okay. <laughs> we'll return him, let him die. <laughs> Yeah, that was funny, yeah. actually. I'm surprised they just didn't go poof. <laughs> yeah. Again, it shows Cisco's character that he basically asks the prophets to save the guy's life. Yeah. Well, back to Miles' quarters and Keiko is working and Miles seems restless. <sighs> she, she tells him to do something when he just kind of sighs, just like you just did. 
Keiko tries a different tactic. She says she ran into Julian the other day and he seemed depressed. Do we have to talk about this? Yes. He says, well, I could go spend an hour with him. And she says, maybe two. When he leaves, then she calls Julian and tells him that Miles has been depressed. You know, a really good way of dealing with this is communicating with your partner. Yeah. This is almost the one part of the story that I could tolerate. Keiko just being like, oh my God, go play with your friend. And realizing that Miles thought he was doing the right thing by staying home. But in a grown-up relationship, you have to have other interests and be allowed to have friends. Otherwise, you stagnate and you resent the other person. So, you know, I'm glad that she at least pushed him out the door. But yeah, of course, grown-ups should just have that conversation. Yeah. But at least she did it, and at least it got him out of the house, because this was really being annoying. Yeah, I don't think you could have gotten more stupid if you tried. Well, we've had worse on this show. Okay. I know this really triggered you, but <laughs> this was pretty bad, but we've had worse. Okay, back to the good storyline. <laughs> all right, all right. In Quarks, Kira gives Cisco a horrible clay <laughs> sculpture, and they both laugh at it. It could be Bajoran Martin art. It could be. They talk about his speech to Bejor the previous day where Sisko told everyone what happened to Akoram and that the prophet said nothing about the Dajaras. Kira says just about everyone was happy to hear it, although probably not Kai Wynn or any of the zealots that were now following the new guy. <laughs> I'm picturing Kai Wynn watching it and going, oh, n no way. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Spoiled again. She's like, oh, oh, back to this guy. <laughs> back to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> We learn that history has changed a bit since Akoram's poems have changed, but the timeline doesn't seem to have changed. Cisco says the prophets work in mysterious ways. And they both laugh. Which is just a hand wave way of saying, <laughs> oh, we don't want to deal with the fact that you just changed history. Oh, I like the way the both of them laughed at that. It was pretty funny. Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> hmm. One of the Bajoran officers comes by then and asks if Cisco can give his daughter a blessing on her 14th birthday. He seems very happy about it, yes. and Kira seems really happy that he's happy. It's very cute. Oh, I love this. Cisco actually, for the first time, seems comfortable both talking about the prophets and accepting his role as the emissary and carrying right. out this blessing or agreeing to do it. And Kira seemed very happy. Yes, they both seem quite happy. I imagine that once he gave it up and he realized it was a mistake, he was very happy to have it back and really lucky because I yes, think, you yeah. know, a lot of times in life when we do something like that, we just end up regretting it forever and you can't get whatever it is back. Right. So, yeah, that was good. But anyway, the end. Okay. So what do you have for over analysis? So, yes, I have one or two pieces of over analysis. Okay. Number one, I am even more convinced that the Miles storyline was actually a leftover script from a 90s sitcom. <laughs> That's all really I have to say about that. Yeah, okay. Second thing. So, Bejor, less than 50 years earlier, it had a strict caste system. Kira said they gave it up during the occupation, which lasted 50 years. That is what she says. Yeah. So, sometime in that period, it was abandoned, which means all the older generation, Kai Wynn, Porter, probably Kyle Parker, had all grown up with first-hand yeah. knowledge of this. I find it difficult to believe that they would have given it up or moved on from this without it still having an awful lot of cultural baggage. That even though it's not enforced, there'd still be the instance like in the replimat of, oh, you're a higher caste, here, have my chair. Just because anybody who was under 50 years old, would have had parents who grew up with that system in place. So it seems that it's been totally forgotten in effectively a generation or maybe a generation and a half, something well, like that. I imagine that this thing with Porta was kind of meant to show you that. Like this guy had maybe been waiting his whole life for it to come back. Oh, that's a great take. Yeah. This is that whole thing where not everybody thinks the same. Yeah. Not everybody's going to be on this exact same path. And so I'm sure there were factions that wanted right. to go back to it and were thrilled to have somebody stand up and say, let's go back to it. I mean, there's stuff like that going on in American politics right now where there's people I'm sure who have been just dying for some of the stuff that's going on with the Supreme Court to go back to the way it was you yeah, know, yeah. 20 years ago. Uh, the or good old days. In inverted the good commas. old days. Exactly. So I'm sure that there was an undercurrent of that yeah. in existence, even though we don't talk about it. Okay. If 
that's the case, yeah, that I think would make the story work a little better because I was thinking if it had been older and had been abandoned a hundred years ago or was even ancient history, so there was no living memory of it, uh, I thought it might have fitted better. Well, it was probably fading. Yeah. You know, it probably wasn't working for everybody at yeah. the time when the occupation started, but the occupation just moved it along because people had to do what they had to do in right. order to survive. Okay. Next thing. So I think at heart, a quorum was actually pretty honest. He was just out of his time and yeah. he couldn't really understand what was happening in this new world. And I think he genuinely believed that he was the emissary. Oh, yeah. When he discovered that he wasn't, the way he gave it up, it was like he was confident enough in his faith to do this in good conscience. Rather than fight Cisco or try and avoid seeing the prophets and finding out who was the right one, he went through with it. Right. So I saw him as an honest, if not misguided character. Well, he was stuck in the past. Yeah, you could imagine that if the same thing had happened to Kai Wen, she would not have given that up. Oh, no. No. Yep. Or someone like her. Yeah. No, I think he probably was a good guy, but he was trying to bring back a time when it worked for him. Yes. But ignoring the, the millions or billions of people that it didn't work for. Well, that can be a comment on a lot of society. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And here's the big one. Oh. This episode, except for the Mars storyline, <laughs> yeah. proves my assertion that the episode, The Visitor, was actually the prophets warning Cisco about Jake's future. I think you're going to have to explain more. Okay. The prophets are really terrible about telling you things and oh. warning you. The best they can do <laughs> okay. is really cryptic. The worst they can do, I think, is this, where they grab some guy that was flying past the wormhole <laughs> from 200 years ago. And send him to Cisco. <laughs> to basically deliver a message that <laughs> results go. in absolute chaos yeah. and potentially sets back Bejor. They don't really get it. It's not a terrible idea. And this is why I think that episode was the prophets telling Cisco he needed to look out for Jake. It's not a bad theory because we talked a lot about did the visitor, did that really happen? Yes. Why didn't the prophets intervene to save him? Well, the prophets wouldn't have intervened if they'd created it. Exactly. The point I made in that episode was they didn't intervene because they could see all time and they knew it would be fine. Everything was going to go back to the way it was supposed to eventually. So to them, it could have just been a total nothing burger, a blink of an eye. Oh, true. But that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that is my theory there. Okay. And my final one. Final, final. Yeah. And unfortunately, I know the whole show timeline. So I'm going to ask you, when the prophets say to Cisco, you are of Bajor, what does that mean to you? <laughs> I have a whole section about that in, <laughs> in my over analysis. Okay. I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> well, I think I passed the over analysis on to you. <laughs> well, well, first I have to say that I really like this religious stuff because I think having a mixture of people of faith and people of no faith is realistic. Yeah. But they're not realistic that there would only be one religion on the entire planet and that everyone would agree all the time. I mean, that's too simple. But if you didn't want the show to be about that, I can see why you would do it. Right. But I'm convinced there's a new church that popped up just devoted to Cisco as the emissary. And now I suppose one to a quorum as the emissary. They would have never accepted the change. The true believers in a quorum. Completely. I was really shocked that nobody questioned Cisco's story. I mean, I can imagine him standing up to give a speech and going, oh, yeah, well, the prophet took a quorum. He's fine. And you know, somebody <laughs> is like, wait a minute. <laughs> Did you just throw him out the airlock? I would expect Kai Wynn to be sitting at the front row shouting blasphemy. Blasphemy. I want evidence of what <laughs> happened. Yes. I mean, nobody had any questions. And also the thing about the timeline, how somehow it changed the poems, but it didn't change the timeline. I mean, okay. that We, we just oversimplified a bunch of things. Remember earlier he said he didn't have any children. Right. And I think him returning wouldn't change the timeline. Oh. Okay, it's weak. How many times in Star Trek have we seen one little tiny thing change, you know, all of history? But yeah, well, I, I, that was just a little hand wavy. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. It didn't ruin anything. I'm just saying it's a little hand wavy. I would agree. But I absolutely have so many questions about what was going on with the prophets. When the Odo prophet says, we are of Bajor, is he making a declaration or is he asking a question? You can't really tell. Yes. And then the Opaka prophet saying, Cisco is of Bajor. 
I mean, I guess he interpreted it to mean that he really is the emissary. And I did assume that it was going to be too spoilery for you to really tell me anything. Yeah. But it seems to me like the prophets were agreeing that they are indeed of Bajor, meaning that they are somehow connected to Bajor. Either they created it or somebody from Bajor created them. That I don't know, but that's kind of how I was yeah. reading it. But why would they say that Cisco is of Bajor? That's very strange. Then I started to think, do they even think Bajor means the same thing that everybody else thinks? Is Bajor really a planet to them? Or is it something else? Does the word have a different meaning? So that was kind of where yeah. I fell. I fell into, wait a second, this means something different to them. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it is just a big religion. I don't know. what What is a religion to a god? I, I don't know. It's just their way of life. <laughs> But I started to think that maybe that word actually meant something different to them. Oh. I really appreciated how protective Cisco is of Bajor, even before Opaka said that to him. Yeah. He was really trying to save them from not going into the Federation and save them from kind of going back to this caste system, which he could see was not the right move. Well, that whole scene where you can see him talking to a quorum and he knows something is wrong here. And yeah. how he's prepared to break the prime directive because it's wrong. Yeah. They were kind of implying that it was because it was his mission yeah. to get them into the Federation. And he was feeling like he was failing. But it seemed like it was more. And especially when he had that echo of Kaiopaka yeah. and then he ran into that prophet of Kaiopaka again. Yeah. That seemed to really change the way that he thought about his role as the emissary. And I think by the end, we're supposed to believe that he was accepting it. But I think it was more than just accepting it. I think he was actually feeling it based on, on what had happened. I like your take on this of based on them saying you are a Bajor. Yes. That's a really good one. Yeah. My one sort of gripe about this yeah. story is that Kai Wynn really should have been involved in this story. Oh. I mean, maybe they just couldn't get her for this yeah. particular episode. But her absence to me was so obvious. I think just a few scenes with her would have been yeah. absolutely perfect. Yes. I am so happy we squashed this cast system thing quickly, though. I don't think I could have put up with it for very long. So <laughs> I'm glad that was gone by the end of the episode. Yeah. Like, nope, never mind. Forget it. It was also funny that it was the first time we'd heard of any of this. So I'm pretty sure yeah, right? it was thought up the week before in the writer's room. I know that kind of stuff is really funny when they have these just gigantic things. Yeah. You know, these societal things. Oh, we never mentioned that. Oh, oh yeah. Didn't we mention that? <laughs> oh, well, never mind. It's gone now anyway. Everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I do want to say something about Miles and Keiko. I mean, I know you don't because I know how you felt about it. It was just so weak and so disappointing. Yes. I definitely wondered if maybe we could chalk this up to they've been apart for so long that they have to sort of relearn how to come back together and relearn how to communicate. Yeah. But they were also kind of morons in season one about stuff, too. So it's almost like we've just kind of gone back to where we yeah. were before. Yes. Sometimes the B stories are just so stupid. And it was the same on Next Gen. Yeah. But I want to give some advice from a functioning relationship. Talk about stuff. <laughs> 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 make decisions together and then be comfortable in the decisions that you make together and know that you're doing it for the good of both of you. <laughs> and also, by the way, have friends and other interests. It's very important. This helps you be yourself when you are in your relationship. In fact, it's a, actually a critical component of a functioning relationship <laughs> that you are a human in your own right <laughs> with your own feelings and your own ideas. Yes. This is the relationship part of the podcast. <laughs> this is a Jeez. new part of the podcast, listeners. <laughs> I hope to never have to do that again. I did write an alternate title for this episode as The Trouble with Zealots, but then I said, oh, wait, maybe it's The Trouble with Being Stuck in the Past. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Trouble with Zealots 2 was a good name for it. That is pretty good. Okay, that's all that I had for overanalysis. Did I answer your questions? I think you did. Well, then let's go to Women in the Future. The struggle that Kira has between her faith and her work are just some of Nana Visitor's best acting moments. Yes. Just so great. I loved when she told Cisco that they would have done whatever he had asked of them. And then at the very end of the episode, when she saw Cisco accepting his role as emissary, I mean, just the look on her face is amazing. Yeah. You can read so much into that. 
she doesn't have a lot of scenes, but what she does with the scenes that she has is just so moving and just so great. I think about way back to the beginning uh-huh. of the show, how I couldn't get into her character. I just felt like she was written so one dimensionally. And now we've gotten to this point. I was having this sort of crazy thought. Uh huh about the character of Kira and how she fits into the history of Star Trek. Yeah. If we really think about developed female characters in Star Trek, she's the first. Yes, there were women in TOS, but they were not developed like this. Yes, there were women in TNG. They didn't know how to write for those female characters. There were moments where they did, but not like this. This is the first truly developed female character. I'm not saying it's flawless. They've got some issues, like in her relationships and some other things. But it's just so cool to think about it that way. She's kind of a pioneer here. Ah. But all you have to do are watch some of the episodes with those female characters. Yeah. They didn't. They just didn't know how to write for them. Yeah. It's taken them a while to get here with Kira, but it's really great to see. And yeah. it really makes me want to watch more, which is cool. I'm glad we arrived here oh, with yeah. Deep Space Nine, right? The Nala Visitor just knocks it out the park. Yeah. Though I am really frustrated by how the religious people treat her. You know, she's a believer and a follower, and she ends up with a lot of emotional blackmail from them, and that's super frustrating. My only worry was Kira was happy at the end, which usually means somebody has to die. (laughs) Oh, man. Well, I guess they did get rid of one cleric. They did, yeah. Somebody did die. Yeah. Well, there's not... A lot else to say about women in the future here. I love Dax's little line about how she would really enjoy being a religious icon. That was priceless. It did seem to fit with Jadzia and the symbiont. The one negative I think about women in the future here is that this episode needed Kai Wynn, though she probably would have taken over, which may have ruined it. But And it was really nice to have a brief view of Kai Opaka, yeah. even though you know she wasn't really there, but still. Oh, and also my last, my very last note is uh-huh. Kira's hair looks better in this episode. <laughs> They've tamed it down a little bit, (laughs) which is good. Okay. That's all I have. So let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? Okay. I am so conflicted about this one. I bet. I quite literally despise the Miles storyline. Yeah. It's complete and utter garbage. I think I need to make a cut of this episode with 99.9% of the Miles and Keiko garbage storyline removed. Yeah. And I'd leave in just the part at the beginning with the apartment cleanup and the scene of Keiko shuttle arriving, and that's it. <laughs> and then I could do another cut of taking all the Miles and Keiko stuff and putting a laugh track in, because I think that oh, was what that needed sure. there. I know. It's so hard to give a rating when the B story brings you down so much. I know. I wonder, though, when this first aired, at the age you would have been, would you have even noticed? I think I ignored it. Yeah. None of it registered because it was just bad. And I think most of the Keiko Miles storyline in DS9, I literally just papered over because it was yeah. so weak. It doesn't matter. It, yeah. yeah. It's not well written and it doesn't matter. Exactly. So I'm giving it a thumbs up just because the Cisco Kira storyline and the profits is so good. Yeah. I literally erased the Mars stuff from my mind. <laughs> so it's a thumbs up. Yeah, I'll give it a thumbs up too, though I agree. The B story was terrible. I didn't find it as offensive as you did because it was more offensive, I guess, to the men. Maybe that's my own failing and maybe I would have been more (laughs) offended if it had been to the female character. But you got to ignore that part to get the good stuff out of this episode. And that's always frustrating. We've had that struggle times before in doing our ratings where the B story was so horrible. (laughs) It was like, oh my gosh, what are you people doing to me? But the A story is so meaningful and acted so beautifully by both Avery Brooks and Nana Visitor. Yeah. That you got to give it a thumbs up and you got to put that other part out of your mind. <laughs> just forget about it because it's terrible. Agreed. Yeah, because I just worry about whining about the episodes. They can't fix it at this point. But yeah, they you'd wish they would do better. And yeah. they do better in the future of Star Trek. Let me, I guess, look at it that way. That's true. Okay, that wraps it up for Season 4, Episode 16 already. Come back next week for Episode 17. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. Also, check us out on talkthroughmedia.com. 
You can leave feedback there for individual episodes, and you can also listen to the other podcasts on our network. For example, you can listen to Star Trek Prodigy, a Rebinge It podcast, which is, at this point, I was going to say a new podcast, but it's our newer podcast where we watch Star Trek Prodigy, the animated series. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it from me. 